In this video, we are going to talk about 3D scanning output and what option do I need. Now, as a company that's been doing scanning for almost 20 years, we get asked all the time from our customers, what are the different output options and which one is right for me? And there's a lot of misinformation out there as to how the 3D scanning process actually works and how different output options are actually created. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to talk about that. So we'll go through who EMS is. We'll talk about what is 3D scanning. We'll talk about the 3D scanning native formats. We'll talk about the four most common output options and then which one is right for you based on your application. So to start with, as I mentioned, EMS has been focused on 3D scanning and engineering for almost 20 years, and our goal is to help manufacturers solve tough inspection and reverse engineering challenges faster and more precisely. We have a lot of different 3D scanning equipment and software and engineers who've been involved in this industry for years. So we can do very small to very large and complex uh, uh, objects, uh, both 3D scanning, reverse engineering, and inspection. So we've seen a lot of different things. Now, let's talk about what is 3D scanning. So 3D scanning is really just the digital collection of points in 3D space using a 3D collection device. Now, we're not gonna go into all the different types of scanners in this video, uh, but there are many different ones out there. Uh, including laser-based, structured light, LIDAR, CT, photogrammetry, probe tip, and many others. Um, but at the end of the day, they all just collect points. Uh, some of them collect, you know, uh, a few points uh, all the way up to uh, systems that collect millions of points. Now, all scanners natively collect points. Uh, and they're basically just 3D points in space you know, as XYZ values, and they're usually output in formats like PTS, PTX, XYZ, ASC, FLS, and other formats. Now, some 3D scanning software that comes with their works with the scanners can then convert those point clouds into what we call polygons or triangles. Uh, you'll hear those words interchanged all the time polygon mesh, triangulated mesh. Um, the mesh is basically, you know, a three-sided triangle uh, filling in those points with the face uh, and a normal vector. And those are typically in formats like STL, OBJ, PLY, and Vermal. So what we'll do next is let's go ahead and take a look at some of these different formats of 3D scan data and show what they actually look like uh, and then we'll go on and talk in more detail on what we can do with that data. Okay, so let's start by looking at a point cloud file. Now, this um, scan right here, this is a single scan. You can see it's the front of an aircraft. This was done by a long-range scanner. Um, now, from a distance, it looks, you know, pretty solid, like it's a solid geometry. Uh, but you're going to notice as I zoom in, let's come up here on the nose, and as I get in really, really close, what you'll start to see is points. Now, they may be difficult to see here on the screen. I'm going to make them larger uh, and then zoom in a little more. But they're literally just rows of X, Y, Z points. That's all this is. So there's no face to them. There's, they're literally just points, and I'll zoom back out. Um, now, this is a very, very you know high density scanned, um, so it will, from a distance, uh, you know, look solid, but it's not. It's just points. And if I turn on some of the other scans, what you'll notice is none of them are lined up. So that's typical of a long-range scanner. You'll take all the scans from different orientations, and then you'll go through a whole process of aligning it and cleaning it up. And then once you get that all aligned, then typically you're going to convert that to a polygon model, so let's take a look at that. All right, so now I've loaded in um, the result of taking all of those 3D scans in point cloud format, aligning them all, and then merging them together 
into a polygon mesh, which again is basically triangles. So now you can look at it, the surface is, you know, it's not as flat, it's more reflective um, because you have those faces. But if I come in and zoom in, um, you're going to see it, it remains, you know, solid or you're having a face on it. And if I come in here and actually turn on the triangle edges, um, you're going to see it's all a bunch of, of triangles. So uh, typically when we get started, uh, if the scanner uh, natively outputs points, we're going to put them all together, align them, and merge them into a polygon mesh. So that's what a polygon mesh looks like versus a point cloud. Okay, so let's talk about point clouds and polygon meshes and the fact that they are not CAD files. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions. Uh, when you saw that airplane uh, from a distance, you'd look at that and it looks nice and rendered, but it is not CAD. Uh, and the definition of CAD to me is there's really no geometry intelligence, meaning there's no planes, there's no cylinders, there's no features, there's no mathematical surfaces, there's no lines, etc. Um, and it's typically not complete. You, you, if you looked at that data, um, it, it, it's uh, missing data. You see scatter data floating around. Um, areas are not all there. There's some areas that are rough. Uh, maybe because the surface was highly reflective or uh, translucent or, you know, very dark or, you know, some reason. Um, so scan data is typically not ready for downstream manufacturing processes such as injection molding or metal casting, CNC machining, uh, assembly modeling fabrication, and they cannot be output in formats like STEP. I just and Parasolid. People say to us all the time, hey, can you scan that and save that scan file as a step file or an I just file or a Parasolid? You cannot do that. Um, CAD systems also cannot typically open a point cloud or a polygon and do anything with them. Uh, if you import the, the, the polygon, which is like an STL model, if you import that into your CAD system, you cannot cut sections through it, you cannot measure it, you cannot extract any features from it. You, you Basically, you can look at it. Um, the other uh, problem with scan data is it's an exact copy of what you scanned. So it is a manufactured part or as built part. So things are crooked, things are not flat, things are not perfect. And typically in a CAD model, you build it so that things are parallel and perpendicular and a, a circle is round and things like that. So the process we have to go through is to take this polygon data, which is not real CAD, and turn it into CAD. And there's a whole process to do that, and we're going to talk about that. Okay, so let's talk about the four main types of output and typically what they are used for. So we talked a little bit about the what comes natively from the scanner, which is either points or polygons, and those can be used for certain applications, and we're going to talk about those. And then we're going to talk about uh, surface models and what those could be used for. Um, there's a thing we call hybrid models, and then finally feature-based or solid models. So we'll go through now each one of these output types and we'll talk about uh, what the typical applications are for each one. Okay, so looking at points and polygons, which we discussed already as the native scanner output, what can you do with files in that format? Because they can be used. And it's typically used for things that are very organic, very freeform in shape. Uh, good examples are things like sculpture and art, you know, things like that. They they're, can't really de be defined easily with surfaces or uh, sketch-driven solid models, things like that. They're very organic, like you see here with this statue, other than the base, but the rest of it is very organic in shape. So that's one that it's used quite a bit. It's also used a lot in civil, GIS, AEC 
um, they will go out and scan, you know, huge buildings and structures and bridges uh, and things like that. And they have an immense amount of data. And the time it would take to convert all of that to 3D CAD can be pretty extensive. And it's not always needed. Many times they can work right with the point cloud data and they use very specialized software to do that. They can extract dimensions, they can cut sections, they can build you know, partial models or do the things they need to do um, and work with the, uh, with the, cloud, uh, with the uh, point cloud or, or polygon data. Also for 3D printing, uh, 3D printers uh, can accept STL files, uh, basically polygon meshes. Now, the key thing there, though, is the model has to be what we call watertight, meaning, you know, completely closed. Uh, and there is software that allow you to take 3D scan data and fill in holes, smooth out the data, you know, make changes to it. Those are traditionally not uh, uh, traditional CAD software. Um, they're, they're other animation and, and, and software specific for that. Uh, but keep in mind, you're getting exactly what you scanned. So um, if the scan data is rough or stuff is missing, you know, you'll have to work with it. Uh, but there are times where you're just trying to duplicate something or scale it up and down, uh, up or down. Um, you know, that is a good choice you have. And then also simulation and animation. Uh, similar to 3D printing, many times they can just work with uh, that scan data as it is, or uh, again, make some edits to it. So those are the primary uses of these types of files. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples. Okay, so here's that file. And if you take a close look at it, you can see it's, it's very organic in shape. Um, it would be very difficult to try to define this somehow with traditional CAD software, pretty much impossible. Um, other than the base, which was actually added on uh, in software, but again, and if we zoom in, you can see the scan data, you know, we did have to go through a process and actually fill it in because the scanner couldn't get in, you know, scanners are line of sight and they can't get in everywhere. So we did use software to kind of fill in these voids everywhere. Uh, but the application here was just to scan it, close it all up, put a base on it, um, so that it could be um, scaled up and down and, and 3D printed for for actually a casting process. So, so this is what it looks like. If I turn on those polygon edges, you got to zoom way in. Uh, you can see a little hard to see here. Let's, but um, that's what you know. Again, it's just a polygon uh, mesh. Turn on the back faces there, so you can see what that looks like. So again, no intelligence. It's just a bunch of. Um, triangles but again for a lot of applications whether it's a rendering or 3d printing um, this would work just fine now this data here is more of your building aec gis type data this is a, a structure uh, that was scanned and originally it was point clouds and then converted um, into polygons but you can see this is a huge file and converting all of this to cad would be a, a lengthy process and many times what um, people want to do is just maybe go in and take measurements. Maybe they're retrofitting new equipment in the building uh, or the structure, and they need to just be able to place or fit things in. Um, but uh, they'll just leave this data as polygons and then kind of work with it as reference data. So this is another good example of where you would just work with data. Um, as uh, polygons uh, to do what you want. And again, you're going to use very specialized software um, used in that industry uh, to be able to import these files and then uh, work with them. All right, so the next type we're going to talk about is surfaces. Um, these are mathematical surfaces. So different than polygons, um, most surfaces are four-sided. Now, they can be trimmed, but uh, underneath, they're, they're typically four-sided. And they're mathematically defined. There's lots of different of types of surfacing and, you know, Bezier and NURBS and so forth. We're not going to go into all of that uh, today. That would be a very long conversation. But um, unlike polygons, where you have to basically have millions and millions of them uh, to, 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 to define something, surfaces, um, typically the model is going to be smaller. Um, and the, uh, the surface patch has math involved in it. So there's a lot more intelligence. It's a CAD entity um, that you can do things with in CAD. So the CAD system understands what it is. Now, the typical applications for surfacing 
are really still organic stuff like the polygon data. Um, but again, we've mathematically defined them so that they can be used in you know, manufacturing and design processes. Um, so where we typically would create surface models are things that are still organic, um, things like automotive exteriors, you know, marine boat hulls and decks and things like that, um, certainly aircraft exteriors, and again, basically organic, very freeform, flowing type shapes that are not easily sketch defined, um, you know, solid model type, you know, define, you know, uh, definitions. And there's really two types of uh, surfacing techniques you can use. Um, as you see in the car here, this is a process called auto surfacing. And the software would go through uh, the uh, polygon data and it would just fit surfaces um, as it sees uh, as it, the software has different algorithms to determine, you know, how big to make the patches, um, the, the, basically the squares, you know, um, but it's, it's somewhat automatic. Um, you don't have a lot of say in it other than, uh, setting a few parameters and then letting it run. The advantage of this is it's, it's fairly fast and you do get a mathematical representation. Um, but it's not as maybe defined and organized, um, as, as you may uh, want, there may be some design features where you want sharp, you know, edges and corners and, and, and things like that. So the other type is, uh, as you see here on this boat hull, uh, this is a, a longer process where we are creating sketches, creating curves, cutting sections, and then doing things like loft um, and extrude and sweep and things like that and actually taking more time to actually define it. You'll also notice these surfaces are much larger um, because they've all been defined, but they do have hard edges. You see on the chimes here, you see the, the steps here in the boat hull. Um, this is a longer process, but uh, you have even fewer surfaces, but you have more, more definition, more intelligence uh, to it. So let's go ahead and take a look at a couple samples. So let's start by looking at a good example of where you would need a surface model. Now, this is a handgun here, and the fact that we have an FFL allows customers to send them to us. And what they're looking to do is design uh, holsters and um, uh, lights and um, uh, sights and different things that they may want to mount as basically aftermarket accessories uh, on uh, a, a gun like this. And you can see this is extremely um, uh, organic. If you look at the uh, grip over here, this is the raw scan data again. So if you look at the grip, you know, you look at the shape, this is, this is very difficult to model. And all they want is the outside of this um, so that they can design their products around it. But again, they can't work with STL data. They can't bring that into their CAD system. So this is a good fit for the auto surfacing. So if I turn that on and then turn off the mesh, you can see it almost looks the same. And if I turn off the, uh, uh, the edges here, it, it kind of looks like the scan data. But this is all mathematically defined um, as surfaces. And you can see they're, they're very random. They're all four-sided. They're all little mathematical patches. Um, but now it is defined as surfaces, which then allows me to export this in a CAD format like Step, Parasolid, iGES, or the native formats of SolidWorks, Creo, Inventor, etc. So they can then work with this and bring this into their CAD system and then do what they need to do. Now, the one downside of this type of model is you really can't change it. Um, it's it's kind of, uh, it, well, it's related directly to the scan data. So theoretically, you could go back to the scan data and let's say I, you know, deleted an area out and filled it in flat or something. This model would actually then update to that, um, that mesh data, that polygon data. So um, it's not a good choice if you're trying to maybe um, uh, surface it, but make changes to it. It's pretty much an exact representation of that 3D scan data. So you really don't have a lot of downstream editing capabilities to this. So that's one thing you want to keep in mind. And the the how the patches are defined, you know, there are some settings in the software we use that that give you some control over that, but not a lot. I mean, what you see here is pretty much what you get. 
And when you bring this into a CAD system, there's really not much editing you're going to be able to do to this. Um, yes, it's mathematically defined, but you can see it's very, you know, uh, very random in how it does. I mean, they're certainly intelligent in how it does it and breaks it up, but you're not going to take this type of model into your CAD system and um, and change it. It's primarily used so that you can bring it in and design things around it, but it allows you to build solids and surfaces and, and actually use this to cut against them or make things that, you know, made up to it. So that's the one big drawback to auto surfacing is it's not really editable. You won't get, uh, you know, pure sharp corners. Um, you can't um, have a... a a uh, surface create a sharp corner on its own. If you get a, um, you know, a split between two surfaces, you can have a sharp corner. But th the way the software works, it's not intelligent enough to, to say, hey, this is a sharp corner and I'm going to split it right here. It'll try to make smaller patches around those, those sharp edges, but um, you will not get, you know, defined sharp corners. They will be slightly rounded. Um, so again, but, you know, for a lot of things, this is all they need. Um, and you know, it's a good, it's a good option for, for certain applications. Okay. So looking at the bolt hull, this did start out as scan data. You can see here and you can see we're looking at it. It was, you know, basically hung, uh, it was actually hung this way, uh, pulled up uh, high and then we scanned it from underneath. Um, but this is polygon data again. So again, there's no intelligence here. Um, it's just a bunch of triangles. And then obviously we have things like these straps in the way. Um, you know, we, the one side we scanned very well. The other side we kind of scanned as a reference um, with it being symmetrical with typically model one side. But you can see there's some data missing on this side. We have it all over here. So that's the raw uh, scan data. Um, let's turn on the surface model and turn off the scan data. And this is our final mathematic model. And for example, this here, this is a surface loft. This is one mathematical surface. So in CAD software, um, you can, you know, you could CNC machine it. You could design uh, a mold, um, you know, and do extractions and, you know, everything you'd want to do because this is all mathematically defined. Now, how did we go from raw scan data to CAD model? Well, again, there is a fair amount of work. Here are all the sketches that we define, so basically cutting sections or drawing splines, and then we lofted and fit and cut, um, you know, the uh, the geometry to fit this. And you know, this could take um, a day, two days, three days, a week. Um, you know, there there can be some considerable time depending on you know the complexity, uh, the amount of data, things like that. So it's not a push button operation. Um, here's the the history tree of all the modeling done. So you can see it's it's pretty extensive. So lots of lofts. There's 33 lofts in here, and there's lots of trimmings and fillets and sweeps and and so forth. So uh, again, to go from this uh, raw scan data, which is really not usable, to a mathematically defined model. Now this is what can be output into IGES Step Parasolid and even native CAD formats. Um, different softwares will, will allow us to go straight out into uh, formats like um, uh, SolidWorks and uh, Creo, Inventor, NX, AutoCAD, Solid Edge, etc. So, but there is a process, uh, and it can be lengthy to go from scan data. But once we're done, this model can be machined, molded, you know, whatever it may be. This is all mathematically defined, and this is what can be output as I just step or Parasolid. This raw scan data here cannot. The only thing we can do with this is output it as a STL file, uh, OBJ, PLY, those formats we talked about earlier. Because again, there's no intelligence, there's no math here. It's literally points converted to triangles. The next output option is what we call a hybrid model. And that is typically a mixture of surface modeling and feature modeling, or what is referred to a lot of times as solid modeling. These are parts that have some, what I would call prismatic features. So if you look here at the flight stick, you've got buttons. Um, those can easily be defined by sketches or cylinders. But then if you look at the main body, it is very organic and is much more difficult to define by using sketches and extrusions and lofts not to say it couldn't be done, 
uh, but uh, could be difficult. So we use a process of what we call hybrid modeling to do something like this. And again, that's where we're combining using surfacing and then traditional sketch feature modeling. So let's show an example of that. Okay, so let's start by looking at the actual finished CAD model you see here. Now, what you'll notice on the main hand grip um, is this is more of that auto surfacing type model um, where it just puts the, 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 uh, the patches. But then you'll notice up here, like on the buttons and the face, um, this is more of your traditional type uh, surfacing, in this case, in this case, you know, feature-based modeling. Same with these buttons and these cutouts in the bottom here, right? So how was this done? Well, what we did, let's hide the uh, CAD data for a minute. And first we'll show, here's the raw scan data of the part. And then what we did, I'll lay this over the top, is we kind of dumbed down the scan data and took all the sharp corners out and made it basically like the shape you see here. That allows us to auto surface it. And then we went in and using traditional CAD, we then cut away and added in all the features that we needed. Uh, again, because this main body here uh, would be so difficult to model, um, we uh, dumbed down the shape, removed all the sharp corners, made it more organic. We then auto surface that, and then we cut back in the features you see here. So this is what we call a hybrid model. Um, and again, it's a mixture of organic modeling, typically with the uh, standard surfacing or the auto surface type commands, and then feature modeling like you see here. So this is a great way to be able to model something that is highly organic, but yet at the same time has prismatic or sketch-driven sketch geometry as well. And the final uh, type of modeling we do, and certainly one of the most popular, is feature-based solid modeling. Now, this works great for mechanical type parts because it's primarily sketch or dimension driven. And this is how most mechanical CAD software works today. You create a sketch, you will uh, maybe add parametrics or dimensions to control that sketch to make everything perpendicular, parallel, and of a specific size. And then typically you are extruding or lofting or sweeping uh, that sketch, and it you might involve multiple sketches. So this is what we call history tree uh, based modeling, uh, feature based modeling, but you're basically creating sketches um, and then doing something with them and, and typically they're dimensionally uh, uh, controlled. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at a model that is done this way. Okay, so looking at this part in more detail, here again is the raw scan data for this part. This is a casting about uh, 16 inches uh, in diameter. And this is the raw scan data. So again, this is just the polygon data. And, you know, you'll notice uh, things on here from whatever the manufacturing process was. Um, you could have, you know, e ejector pin marks. You could have parting lines. Um, but you also notice the data is not complete because the scanners can't get everywhere. So you can look up under this um, this flange here and you can see the data is missing. You know, some areas over here. This is very uh, common. But the whole data doesn't go all the way through, um, you know, et cetera. And again, this is the as manufactured part. So everything is probably not flat, perpendicular and exactly the way it was designed. And it's also been modified for the, in this case, casting process. So um, even if you could click a button and turn this into a CAD model, um, it probably isn't really going to do you much good because it's just, it wouldn't be a very good CAD model. So let's take a look at the CAD model created and we'll talk a little bit of how that was done. So here is the CAD model and I brought it up and let's leave the scan data overlaid it for a minute. And let's take a look at a deviation. And what you'll see here is you'll notice. So what we've done is turned it on and we've compared the finished CAD model to the 3D scan data. And uh, everything within four thousandths of an inch is green. And you'll notice right away, um, we don't see a whole lot of green. Uh, and we should see a lot, especially on these machine surfaces. 
and I can highlight over and walk around. So this is very typical. So this tells me the part we scanned was not flat, but when we reverse engineered it and build the, built the nominal CAD model, we made everything flat. So now this face here is uh, certainly a little better, um, but you can see, uh, you know, and that's very typical when we reverse engineer. We are going to take and put everything back um, to the way we, you know, the as designed model. So here is that CAD model. And now, you know, we've got uh, planes, we have cylinders, you know, we have different faces, etc. So you can see what that looks like. Now, again, the biggest misconception, though, is people think there's some special button we hit and we get this CAD model. And it's, it's purely not the case. If I walk over here and I were to kind of walk through the history tree, you would see how this was built. So very similar to how all CAD systems work today, but what we're doing is cutting sections through the scan data and we are creating CAD. And we have other videos that go through this process in detail, um, but you get an idea of you know, what it would take um, to build something like this, you know, you can walk through and see, you know, a lot of features, um, you know, there's 60 or 60 plus sketches, um, and fillets and actually, uh, 73. So, um, you know, a part like this could take easily a day or two days or three days to CAD model, you know, depending on the complexity. But once you're done, you have a feature based solid model, and it, you can export that into I just step Parasolid as a neutral format or uh, with uh, this Geomagic Design X software, it has the ability to do what's called a live transfer and open up one of these host CAD systems and actually transfer everything in uh, in the history tree. So it actually rebuilds it. Um, now, to do that, that's even more work because it has to be modeled in a certain way so that, that the host CAD system can accept it, but that can be done. And that's typically when you want to make changes to it, okay? So you can do neutral formats or native formats um, once you do this uh, history tree or feature-based solid modeling. But you get a very intelligent model. This is ready for manufacturing, whether it's machining, molding. Now, you may do some other downstream things to prepare it for that, but this can be read into any CAD system and you can work with it because now it is a true CAD model with intelligence um, to this model. So you can see what that looks like. And once again, if we just turn back on the scan data, you can, you can clearly see the differences between the two. Um, because again, we made everything the way it, the design intent was. So the question comes down to which one is right for my needs. Now, when we work with customers, this is the question that comes up the most common. Uh, and there's a few things that are gonna determine that. So one of the driving factors right away is the shape. Um, that usually has a, a big bearing on what we can actually do. So for example, if it's highly organic, um, your options are probably going to be the polygon model or maybe uh, an auto surface model. Um, and that'll depend on what you're trying to do with it. If you just want to 3D print it or use it for a, a rendering or some animation or something, you can probably get away with just like an STL file. Uh, but like the gun designers where they need to um, use it more to extract information to build things around it, uh, and, and work with it in CAD, they're going to want an auto surface model. Um, if you're doing other downstream applications, such as machining or molding, um, again, you're going to need probably CAD. And then we're going to look you know, closer at the shape. Couldn't we do a hybrid model where the very organic areas, we will just auto surface and then model in the features where needed? Or is it really something that has to be you know, sketch driven uh, modeled all the way through or more of the intelligent surface modeling like the uh, boat hull. So, you know, those questions have to be looked at. And then budget does, you know, come into play here um, as, as well. Um, some people, uh, you know, are on a limited budget and, you know, may have to settle for just a, a polygon model, um, you know, for the time being. But that just depends. Uh, the idea is to really understand the customer's application, uh, what they're trying to do, what the downstream applications are. Another thing is, do they need to edit it? 
Um, can we do that neutral file format for, for like the feature modeling? Or do they need a native CAD format because of the changes they want to make? So again, uh, all of those questions uh, need to be answered to determine what is the right uh, output from the 3D scan data. So that wraps up this video. If you'd like to learn more or have an additional conversation on what the right 3D scanning options are for your particular needs, feel free to reach out, give us a call, or visit our website, and we're happy to have a conversation to help you understand what the right 3D scanning output option is for you.